Now that we have explored our first module subject, why federalism is important to the world, we will next look at our second module question, how do federal countries work and do they all work the same? The first issue we will deal with is how federal countries are structured. How are federal countries structured? First of all, the structures vary. The units that make up federal countries have many names. States, provinces, regions, territories, cantons. All of them can be called constituent units. They are the individual bodies that together constitute the whole country. The United States has 50 units called states. Russia has 86, with a number of different names such as republic and oblast. Some federal countries have very few. Belgium has three regions and three community governments that span more than one region. The Caribbean Federation, St. Kitts and Nevis, and a few other federal countries have only two. A number of federal countries have only four or five units. Pakistan is one of these. In some countries, one unit is much bigger in population than the others. This is true for Australia, Canada, Pakistan, and Argentina. In many others, such as the United States or India, there is no large and dominant constituent unit. Most federal countries have a single type of constituent unit. These are the states, provinces, or other units that are the main partners of the federal or national government. There are also local, town, or city governments. For the most part, these are within the jurisdiction of the states, provinces, or other units. In South Africa, Brazil, and Mexico, they are distinct orders of government whose powers are specified in the Constitution. Some federations have a single dominant language spoken throughout the country. Germany, Mexico, Argentina, and the USA are examples of this. Many federal countries, however, use their federal systems to express and accommodate their cultural, religious, and language diversity. Switzerland has three major languages, and most of its 26 cantons or half cantons are associated with a single language. India's states are designed the same way, on linguistic lines, as are Ethiopia's. Canada and Belgium each have two main language groups. In Canada, one province, Quebec, is officially French, while eight others are English, and one is officially bilingual. Belgium is divided into a French-speaking and Flemish-speaking region, and a bilingual capital region, Brussels. In Pakistan, Sindh province has adopted Sindhi as an official language. Ethiopia decided to organize its federal system on language and ethnic lines. Spain moved from being unitary under the dictator Franco to an evolving federal model. Its constituent units are based on traditional boundaries for such regions as Andalusia in the south, Catalonia on the Mediterranean coast, and the Basque Country in the north. In Nepal, there are no traditional internal boundaries. Defining the constituent units has posed a difficulty as Nepal has tried to federalize. In most federations, there is a rule that says that you cannot change the boundaries of a state or a province without the consent of that state or province. And so that rule has meant that in most federations it's been very difficult to redraw the boundaries of the states. 
Uh, now, there are exceptions. India actually did a, a, a radical redrawing of its boundaries in the 1950s. And then over time, it has it is more or less doubled the number of states that it has. Uh, Nigeria initially had three states and now has 36 states. But in, in every case, what, what happened, uh, this was done over time to move from three to 36. But it was always done under military regimes because they've had an alternance between democracy and military regimes, as opposed to being done through a democratic process. So that, that's generally been the history. Now, the, the, the other exception is that many of the earlier federations, when they were created, had areas that were called territories, as opposed to states or provinces or whatever the other name for the, full, the constituent units were. So the west of the United States was, was a, a sort of territory controlled by the state, the federal government, parts of Brazil, parts of Argentina, the west and north of Canada. Uh, and th these territories were over time uh, populated by uh, n newcomers and carved into states or provinces which were then brought into the system. It didn't require the consent of individual states who were having their boundaries changed, but there was always a constitutional process uh, to turn a territory into a state or province or to create a state or province out of a territory. Now that we've come to the end of this section, let's summarize what we've learned on how federal countries are structured by trying the following exercise. I'm going to read a statement to you based on what we have learned in this lesson, and I'm going to ask you to think about whether that statement is true or false. After giving you a few seconds to think, I will review the statement and give you the correct answer. One, federal countries are divided into constituent units. What do you think? Is that statement true or false? True. Federal countries are divided into units that together constitute the whole country. These constituent units may be called by different names, states, provinces, regions, autonomous communities, territories, cantons, republics, oblasts, and a number of others. Two, all federal countries have the same number of constituent units, true or false. That is false. Some countries have a large number of constituent units, such as the United States, which has 50 states, or Russia, which has 86 constituent units, and others have few, such as Belgium, which has six, or Pakistan, which has four provinces, six tribal areas, and one capital district. Three, the constituent units are the main partners of the federal or central government in the governing of a federal country. Is that true or false? That is true. In federal countries, the country is governed through a partnership between the federal or national or central government and the governments of the constituent units. For a number of federal countries have created their constituent units around the religious, cultural, or linguistic diversity of those countries. Is that true or false? That's true. Federal constituent units are sometimes created to accommodate the country's cultural, religious, and language diversity. Five, it is easy to redraw boundaries of existing constituent units in most federal countries. Is that true or false? That's false. Typically, it is difficult to reduce the area of existing constituent units in existing federal countries once they are established. Creating new units or expanding them out of territories subject to federal jurisdiction is usually easier. Now that we have a better understanding of how federal countries are structured, we can proceed to learn about how powers are divided in federal countries. Once a federal country has its constituent units, the big question is to decide who does what. 
What is the federal government's role and what is the role of other governments? No two federal countries are alike in how they do this, but there are clear patterns in the way federal countries divide powers. Here are some of the areas where the federal or national government usually has control. The currency. The armed forces and defense of the country. Treaties with other countries. Foreign trade. Customs and immigration. Here are some of the areas where the constituent units, whether called states, provinces, territories, cantons, or something else, often have control. Primary and secondary schools. Universities and other post-secondary institutions. Hospitals and health care. In Canada, the Constitution clearly states what the federal government is responsible for. The Army, Foreign Affairs, the currency, criminal law, and external trade, for example. The provinces have health care, education, and natural resources. The environment and many other matters are shared responsibilities. All countries make an effort to allocate powers. And you can have what you, powers which are allocated to the central government on a list, powers which are allocated to the constituent units, and you, where it, each of which can be deemed to be an exclusive power. And then you can also have what are called concurrent powers, which uh, are given to one government, almost always the, the federal government, as the, as the predominant government, but where the other order of government can also make laws on those subjects as long as it doesn't, uh, their laws don't contravene those of the predominant uh, government. So that's the basic pattern, uh, but there's also the question of, of those powers which are not articulated, and those are called residual powers, and in some constitutions, the only powers which are stipulated are those which are going to the central government, say, or perhaps the, the, the states, and all the other powers are deemed to go to the other order of government. But typically, what's more important are the articulated lists, and all of these questions of the allocation of powers have to do with who has the right to make laws. But there's more than just making laws that matters in a federal country. There's also the issue of money. And in many federal countries, uh, the federal government, or both governments, but particularly the central government, have a, what's called a spending power. And they can use that power to sort of say, okay, states or provinces, we're going to give you uh, all this money to do this, if you agree. And maybe you're going to have to match some of that money. And the, then, the, then the states or provinces find that even if that was in the, an area where they had the legislative power, the federal government is using the spending power to try to influence what they're doing. And you, that's quite a common phenomenon in a lot of federal countries. Germany has an interlocking system. It's sometimes called administrative federalism because federal laws are administered by the constituent units. This requires a great deal of cooperation between the federal and the land governments. In Germany, the federal upper house, the Bundesrat, where the lender are represented, plays a big role in making this cooperation work. South Africa, since the end of apartheid, has adopted a somewhat similar interlocking system. Usually, all states, provinces, regions, or other constituent units have the same powers. In some cases, federal countries have decided to allocate different powers to some units. This is called asymmetry. If some constituent units get increased or special powers, there is often pressure to reduce the influence of those units on the central or federal government. The country could limit the number of the representatives in the federal government, for instance. That is why most extra powers assigned asymmetrically in constitutions are relatively minor ones. 
Canada is an example of a federal country that does allocate some powers asymmetrically. The only predominantly French-speaking province has special powers in such fields as immigration and language and culture. Quebec also runs certain social programs, such as pensions, which are harmonized with the Canadian programs. Malaysia has special arrangements for its states on the island of Borneo. They have increased powers over native laws, fisheries, immigration, forestry, and communications. Other countries that have asymmetric arrangements include India, Spain, Russia, Belgium, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Some of these arrangements are negotiated and administrative. Some are specified in the Constitution. However federal countries decide to allocate powers, it is an issue that can cause conflict. A democracy is all about uh, competition and conflict in a way. I mean, we have different political parties, voters vote, you know, have different views. Uh, those political parties are often stronger in one part of a country than in another. So there's lots and lots of conflict in federal countries as there is in unitary countries. What's particular to federations is that you can sometimes get conflict not just within an order of government between the political parties, but between the federal government and the states and provinces or some states and provinces. And maybe, maybe they're fighting over uh, whose who's legislative authority it is. Maybe they're fighting over, well, you're, you're trying to make us do this, but you haven't given us enough money. Maybe they fundamentally disagree on what should be done, that you're trying to get us to adopt a, an agricultural program that has this characteristic, or you're, but uh, we actually think it should be a diff different kind of program. I mean, you don't need to, to stretch your imagination very far to think about the different kinds of conflicts that can emerge. Uh, and sometimes they get solved through negotiation and discussion. Sometimes they get solved uh, because you go to the courts if there's a question of who has legal authority. And sometimes they get solved because every now and then the voters get to vote. And maybe they toss out one government uh, and the, the, you know, the new governments uh, f find a deal. And that ends the section on how powers are divided in federal countries. And as we did in section one of this module, let us try a true or false exercise. One, the roles of the federal government and of the constituent unit governments vary from country to country. True or false? That is true. The role of the federal government and the role of the constituent governments do vary from country to country. However, there are some clear patterns in the way federal countries divide powers. Federal or national governments usually have control or responsibility over currency, defense, treaties, foreign trade, and customs. Constituent unit governments, such as the states, provinces, or whatever they're called, normally have responsibility for such matters as education and health care. Two, there is no simple formula for determining the appropriate allocation of powers between orders of government. Is that true or false? That is true. There is no simple formula, and while there are some patterns, there is also great variety. Some countries use an interlocking system which requires a great deal of cooperation. Examples of that are Germany and South Africa. Others use an asymmetrical pattern for allocating powers to some constituent units that are not allocated to others. Canada is an example of that with regard to the province of Quebec in particular. We hope the exercises at the end of the two sections of this module have helped you to formulate an answer to the question we asked at the very beginning. How do federal countries work and do they all work the same? So how do you answer that question? It's probably easier to start at the latter part. Do they all work the same? Well, as we have seen, they do not all work the same. They all have their own challenges and they all have their own solutions. And as for the first part of the question, how do federal countries work? Well, each federal country works within the confines of its own real-life conditions, its own geography, 
population, history, and its own politics. Thank you.